Oh, Y'all need us to send our yeah. But this is this is good. All right, we call this special workshop meeting the Jacksonville City Council in order, and we have a, a proposed agenda before you tonight with uh, two items on it, and uh, we entertain a motion to adopt the agenda. So moved. Second. Have a motion and second. Any comments or discussion? Hearing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed? Okay. We have uh, two items. We have the sign ordinance amendments and the camera amendments, and we'll I'll turn it over to Dr. Woodruff at this time to uh, introduce our topics. Thank you, Mayor. Members of Council, several weeks ago you were kind to take a bus tour where we went out in the community and looked at several issues having to do with signs. We believe that we receive direction from the council but prior to actually proceeding with the development of ordinances taking them through the planning advisory board and bringing them to you for formal formal adoption we wanted to have a little bit more focus today and we're going to be asking you to uh, give us direction on a point by point issue if you'll recall we looked at the heights of signs we looked at message boards we also looked at feather flags and portable signs and then we also looked at uh, signs that are applied on the inside or outside of windows. I'm going to ask Ryan and Abigail to take over now and walk you through this. And what we would like in each of these is your direction as to whether you want us to proceed with preparing that for an ordinance, whether you want to take a different tack. So Abigail, please. Thank you, Dr. Woodruff. Um, yeah, at any point, if you have any questions or I would like it to be more of an open discussion. So if you want to jump in or anything as we're going through this by point. Um, when we did the UDO, we did not do anything to update the sign regulations. So there's things like electronic message boards, vinyl graphics that aren't really addressed clearly in our ordinance. So rather than kind of doing the piecemeal that we've done over the past, we have basically four issues that are reoccurring as we're doing permitting that we just kind of try to figure out which direction to go on those. The most recent updates were we did the development entrance signs where we lowered those heights. Um, we also changed the way we look at wall signs. We used to do a calculation that connected your lot frontage and your wall size. We've separated those, and those both have been pretty successful as far as um, sign companies liking the lower height and businesses liking the ease of calculation for their wall signage. So we still have the first one, which is our max height for non-development entrance signs is 35 feet. So if you are a standalone building, you can have your sign up to 35 feet, but if you're a multi-tenant or a shopping center, you're only up to 15 feet. So here are some examples of some of the tall signs we have throughout the city. And then this is one of the lower um, development entrance signs. So from the bus tour, the kind of direction that we got from you guys was to drop that to 20 feet. So it would be pretty easy ordinance change, just changing the max height. Um, and if you don't really have any other suggestions on that one, that's a nice, easy one that we can move forward with. Go back one if you don't mind. So really, what we believe that you were in favor of from the bus tour was to do what the industry had asked us to do, because several of the local shops have said uh, that they cannot install signs 35 feet tall. And then we also know that most of the national chains that are coming in, actually every national chain that's come in in the last year, has only requested the sign 20 feet in height even though they could be at 35 feet. So if you're comfortable, we're prepared to proceed with ordinances in the next month or so, but we would like your direction. I have a question. Um, I'm not sure how much um, I should be involved in this, but um, why would we allow a multi-tenant to only have 15 feet but a single tenant to have 20 or other. It seems to me that a multi-tenant would need just as much as a single tenant because they're trying to give enough space to the tenants. I know that we uh, have had some issues with trying to design um, in the smaller uh, because what happens is based on the amount of tenants then the sign becomes really low to the ground but it's still overhead and where maybe it really should be a monument sign. You know what I mean? It's sort of that in-between mark where it would be better if it was a few feet higher 
aesthetically and sort of a mid-range where somebody tall could, does that make sense? Yeah, with the multi-tenant, we do require it monument style, which is like the Jacksonville Mall example of Phil. So all multi-tenants are monument? Uh, correct. We are not proposing 15. that with the freestanding. Okay. So that kind of sign there, there would be limited to what, height, 15? Yes. Okay. And so that it wouldn't be pylon. It would no, be the development entrance. Okay, correct. that makes sense. And Thank so you. that's why we have that slightly shorter than the pylon, not at this height, but the Got that it. style <laughs> sign, where it's more of a pole in the side of the top. How tall was that sign that was? That's probably the Ramada is actually I think one of the tallest. I believe it's forty feet. It's, it's over thirty-five. Yeah. Now, one thing that we did want to ask, and uh, but let's focus on one question at a time. How do you feel about changing in the corridor commercial and the industrial districts that the maximum height for a uh, a y'all call these pole signs? Freestanding signs. Freestanding signs being twenty feet. You comfortable with that? Now, let me ask a, a question that that you uh, that several ordinances have in them. The city does not have in them uh, what we would call an amortization ordinance. This is uh, in many communities. What you have is that as regulations change, you give businesses that would then be non-conforming, you give them a time period in which to conform. Normally, it is based, especially on something that has the dollar value of this particular sign, you give them either five or seven years to bring themselves into compliance, which means that basically they've had the opportunity to do the tax depreciations and so forth. It is something that, uh, that if you want to have us look at, we can bring you back more information. On the other hand, signs like this, uh, if you did not have that, they can continue even though they're legal nonconformities. And again, you can see uh, the Hardy sign. You can certainly see the Adam and Eve sign. I know that uh, you know many communities do not have amortization. They let these stay in until the developer or owner decides he wants to change. Other communities amortize it. Have any thoughts? Is, is it possible to get a count? Would that be difficult to say how many are over the 25 foot? No, that's not difficult at all. We'll be very happy to do that. Uh, we probably will, <clears throat> pardon me, we will probably have the ordinance amendment to 20 feet long before we have that additional work. But we can certainly uh, give you copies of how they work and what the number of signs would be impacted. I'm just wondering how many we actually have that are above the 20 feet. That may make it easier to make yeah. a decision. Yeah, get a get a get an approximate number, and uh, you know, uh, get some idea of a uh, of a solid amortization schedule what schedule for that. What happens if the uh, Ramada becomes the Hampton or something? It doesn't they impact. Lose, they lose their no, it they doesn't impact that because what you're dealing with is the structure itself is non-conforming, not the title or the name that's on it. Yeah, we allow face replacements, so like the Adam and Eve to, could switch out to any business, but it would maintain the same cabinet. So you wouldn't be changing the actual sign structure, just the message. We, we do have a non-conforming section of the ordinance to where if they came in and did a major overhaul, remodel, renovation project where they were putting thousands of dollars in the building, there is a threshold that requires the signage to comply with current codes. So we already have that in place. Same point of fairness to other businesses that are conforming. I'd be in favor of favor of the amortization clause, but that's just me. Yeah, me too. Let us get you some information. <coughs> Obviously, we're not asking you to make a position on that. Just authorize us to do research. We'll bring it back to you. Is that fair? Just a, just a quick question. Uh, what, what do you reckon that Ramada sign is worth? you had to guess um, that Ramada sign is probably a $70,000 sign I have a hard time mm -hmm. telling somebody that uh, just because they've amortized the the cost of it they've got to tear it down and put a, a $50,000 sign back up in its place that would be well, hard for me to, to justify in this particular case more than likely what they would be able to do is they would basically be able to cut the pole and shrink it down 
And one of the reasons why its play has that seventy thousand dollar value is that's an electronic reader board sign. Well, it's there. just um, it, that's part of it, but primarily because it's so high off the ground, the, the infrastructure is, is expensive. Ryan, I have a question. Say, for example, the Ramada Inn sold. You know, let's just say the Marriott decided to want they wanted to come in, and the Marriott decided that it didn't want it freestanding like that they want their message to be digitized could it possibly be changed and would that affect our ordinances we allow <laughs> first of all it's already an electronic message signed with one of the other items we're going to talk about tonight we're going to talk about upping the percentage to 50 percent so a part of that sign could be or 50 percent of their allotment if council approves the the next thing that we're going to talk about they could go back to 50 percent digital mm. right now they're capped at 30 percent which we can move on to the electronic message board discussion um right now we have for the development entrance sign like you saw with the jacksonville mall they are allowed 50 percent <coughs> the freestanding is allowed 30. <coughs> so we would propose just like kind of worry making the height more equal we do the same with the electronic message board right now we don't have any regulations for luminosity we don't really have much that addresses the electronic message board other than the percentage of the sign allotment. So we have a flashing sign that says anything that changes more than 30 seconds is considered a flashing sign and prohibited. So therefore, the electronic message boards is 30 seconds, next message, 30 seconds. So it's a slow change. DOT standard is eight seconds. We've done some traffic research and stuff like that. They're kind of all over the board. There's not really any definite research that says a certain time is safer or less safe than another. So we have 30 seconds now. We've heard from uh, owners of these signs that that's a pretty long time. DOT is eight seconds and on the next slide, um, I guess a couple slides, we have a couple examples that we can show you kind of what three seconds looks like, what five seconds looks like, what 10 seconds looks like. Before you do that, mm -hmm. uh, DOT is uh, is irrespective of speed. It's just a flat eight eight seconds. From what I read, yes. It's eight seconds for the the billboards. Right, irrespective of speed, whether it's on a, an interstate or whether it's on a any other any other road. And I did some research since our last meeting, and the standard pretty much throughout the electronic industry is from eight to ten seconds. Yeah, here was some different jurisdictions that I've pulled up. Um, it gives you how many jurisdictions the seconds um so it's kind of on the majority the shorter end um a couple of have variances to decide and that's probably when they do an individual analysis of speed um yeah some of them 24 hours once a day um so th there's not a whole lot of consistency but it seems like a lot are between that two and ten second the two issues when it comes to electronic boards, whether they're the small message boards like the one you saw at Jeff's Burgers or whether it's a billboard. Uh, currently, the city does not allow billboards to change. I will say to you that we have been in discussions for probably, what, John, two, maybe three years. The billboard industry would like to do this. I would say to you that if you take this move, that doesn't mean, nor should it send any signals to the billboard industry that you're in favor of doing this on large billboards that are 320 square feet and larger. When you go back to this particular issue, we think that there are two safety issues. One is the frequency of the change of the message. The second is the luminosity. It is not so much luminosity at day, it is luminosity at night. Now, Ashley Weaver is with us, captain of the police department. Uh, Ashley, you may want to come up and, and uh, join us if you don't mind. We've asked the police department to uh, do some analysis and do some research. And I think what you're going to find is that it really isn't conclusive. But Ashley, if you would. Um, so a few of the places that we made contact with were NHTSA, the uh, National Highway Traffic Safety Administration. And speaking with them and the University of North Carolina's Highway Safety Research Center, they were, uh, were able to forward us towards a couple of scholarly papers. Um, one of the scholarly papers was from England that basically researched the the brilliance of the LEDs had a negative impact on night vision. So there was no real research for daytime having an effect, but it did affect night vision and driving. 
in, in that manner. Um, there was no conclusion as to how it impacted crashes. That, that part of it wasn't researched. Um, and then the other ones that we looked at, there was some research into the gaze behavior of how people look at it, but unfortunately none of it was conclusive on its actual impact to distracted driving because that data is so difficult to obtain through regular crashes and to actually do the research the time and intensity they would have to put into it. So unfortunately a lot of what we found was everyone says it's a problem, but we don't know how much of a problem it is. Um, so were you able to establish any, any research that had done anything as far as the frequency of changing those signs and how that might the only research that I was able to find on time was more of research in how much information a person can read at 55 miles an hour and how many words can be on a sign for them to be able to take in that information. And what that says that if you were an NC State graduate <laughs> or a Clemson graduate, you're going to have a different time period. And you don't have to go to class to get in. <laughs> that was at UNC. I thought that was at State. Okay. Sorry. You know, our, our thinking on this is these message boards, uh, the investment is in the message board. And the message board itself can be regulated as to uh, how many seconds. We feel comfortable recommending to you the DOT standard of allowing them to change once every eight seconds. What that basically means is that you're going to have somewhere in the vicinity, depending on whether they want eight seconds, you're going to have seven messages every minute. Now, what we cannot recommend to you is what we have at one of the establishments up on Henderson. I won't mention the athletic facility there, but they're basically showing movies. It never, it is not a picture that stops and a few seconds later, another picture. Uh, you may actually have some of those. So let's take a second to look at the difference. Abigail? This is a five second and we can go, there's also a 10, 15, 30. But you see it's a static image then it just continually changes. One thing I would point out is that this is pretty much an instantaneous change. You can have it where it flies in and we would want to see that change happen very rapidly And for sort of the opposite spectrum, here's a 30 second, which is what we currently have. Makes 30 seconds seem pretty long. It does a large <laughs> Good, good I think, you know, from my experience, and I'm, I'm probably one of the largest dealers of these things locally, I think anything from 10 seconds to 15, 10 seconds, I think you're okay. I, I really don't think that you're, it's not, we don't even tell our people, even if we could give them instantaneous changes, we wouldn't recommend it because studies show that the message won't be effective. I mean, it's just not effective if it constantly strolls. And it's the same thing with if somebody's shown a movie, it's really not a study show that it's not effective, that you need to let a message sit so people can see it for a period of time. And you could see, you know, like 10 or 15 seconds is a good period of time. Um, I don't see anything wrong with that area. Uh, uh, and, and the only reason for the shorter period of time is for people that have smaller message centers where they can't get a full message on a screen and it takes maybe three screens to say what they need to say. But the reason the data isn't readily available because it's only been in the last three years where they really have become a more sellable item to the normal market because of the full color. The days of the red LEDs or the white LEDs, 
you know, banks used to get them with time and temps and only certain people. But now that the availability of full colors there and you can actually get a decent message, you have more businesses investing in these. So there, I don't know that there's a lot of data in it other than um, the, uh, the length of time where you want a message to stay. The other thing is I'm not sure if, if the luminosity can be adjusted to a point three. Some message centers don't, don't, give, you, they don't give you that option. The, the less expensive ones won't give you that option. The more expensive ones will let you adjust a day and night luminosity, but I'm not sure if it's by points or not. I can get you that information. Well, from the research we've done so far, the concern at night is the luminosity. You know, if you have, uh, you know, eight or ten seconds, we feel that that's reasonable. The real concern, though, is the intensity. If you would like to see one that I would guess is about uh, three uh, uh, foot candles, 0.3 foot candles, if you go out towards um, uh, Jeff Berger's, have you measured that to see what that is? Talk to him at all? His is adjustable, though, and um, it was in a different unit than yes. point 0.3. It was in a different unit than foot candles, yeah. but um, it did adjust with the ambient light the day and the night, so it was brighter during the day, and then as it got dark, it didn't. Well, the reason I bring that up is if you're going to write it into an ordinance, I'm not sure that you could say 0.3 because they're not all adjustable that way. And where the, the so. 0.3 came from? The Yeah, so there's um, signs.org uh, is kind of a, mm -hmm. basically it has a bunch of research all nationwide about different companies and different jurisdictions, and they found that basically you do the uh, distance based on the size of the sign and then you measure at that distance so it's not 0 0.3 at the sign like you would go up there right there but accounting for the ambient light you go square root of the distance and then you measure it there so it would have to be somewhat adjustable but it wouldn't it's not saying that it's 0 0.3 foot candles that low when you're right next to it and the other thing too is that because we're, our regulations have multi-tenant signs as monument signs you're going to have more of them down at eye level so you know that will become more of a problem mm -hmm. honestly, so well let us do this if you generally like where we're headed we will do more research on the foot candle issue and how we'll regulate it are you generally comfortable with with uh, shortening the change time though the most distracting sign that I've seen in a long time is in, well, you live in Wilmington, right there on Market Street, mm -hmm. right before Ogden, at, at night, especially at night. And I, I've, I've got this personal thing. I don't like signs that have blue lights or red lights on them, too, because that's very distracting, too. It gets your, makes your blood pressure rise a little bit. You know, but, uh, I don't, but that sign I'm talking about, like in Market Street, is a prime example of a sign that I think is a, a little too much, uh, a little too, little too overboard. And that's a combination of movement brightness mm -hmm. uh, and that one's down low and it's down low yeah. exactly mm -hmm. we do have a church here in town that the sign is a conforming sign it meets all of our percentage criteria but at nighttime they've got a screen it's on gum branch road they've got a white background and when that white background comes on it at night it is very very bright is, is there any research on what is a dangerous um, you know, we're saying point three, but obviously that's got some sort of a safety factor in there. What is, what is a dangerous um, amount of light? Yeah, it's actually the internet. Um, that's the reasoning for coming up with point three was basically. Um, and I, and I and I and where I'm partly where I'm going with this. Let's say that 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 we do the we compute the area and determine that the distance we have to be, but it comes in at point. Three five, you know, is there a, you know, how much, how much, uh, plus or minus, ten percent or, fifteen percent or, you know, or, or, you know, what do we use? If, especially if the signs are not specifically adjustable. I mean, they're, they're probably not really set for point three at at some some distance. Uh, I mean, I don't know how they're calibrated or or adjusted, but yeah, and I think with the um. 
sort of accounting for the ambient lighting, it gives you a little bit of leeway because if you have, you know, street lights shining right there, obviously the sign can be a little bit brighter. I have a question. So accounting for that, I think, helps. Could we just to say his his if you oh, don't mind. One of the things you approved in the UDO is what we will simply call administrative judgment. So your concern was, okay, what if it's point three one? Are we going to say they're in violation? No. The code that you adopted gives Reggie the, arth the authority as the director of that department to go out and use his judgment. Yes. And, you know, let's say that it measures 0.4, but because of the ambient lighting or other <coughs> conditions, it's determined that that's reasonable. You know, the, the one thing we know is that ambient lighting or the lack thereof has a direct impact on the way that these signs, if you pardon the expression, impact your eyes. So. Mm -hmm. And that, and that was partly where I was going with also asking what's a dangerous. I mean, obviously you wouldn't want to give, you know, some, some, you know, you wouldn't want to allow something to be close to the to the dangerous if there is any research on that. Uh, I apologize, sir. You had a question. Well, I think you. I was going to say the same thing. Couldn't we write it within the ordinance, open ended, that if it's a, uh, if if there's a sign that may be exceeding, you know, the safe lighting that we can ask them to turn it down? We'll look at those things and we'll try to get better information relative to what is the danger level. Yeah. I'm curious. I, just, I don't know how you could, if you write it in an ordinance, if you came to me and I said, well, I, I can't, I don't, I don't have a point three to adjust it to. I either have low, medium, or high. And I'm not going to put it on low. You know what I mean? Something you need to think about within that. And what do we need to measure? The tank is measured. Obviously, it's just a light meter. Just a light meter. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The other okay. thing that uh, I do want to mention is, uh, and I want to stress to you again, the sign industry, the billboard industry, has been asking us to go to digital billboards for a number of years. And I will say to you that uh, we are, are generally opposed to that <coughs> unless there is a public benefit. Now, let me explain to you what I mean by public benefit. I don't know how many billboards there are up there. Let's just say there are 50 in the community. Those 50 represents, represent 50 messages. If you were to replace <coughs> one of those with a digital at eight seconds, you've just added seven billboards. So what we have said to the representatives of the billboard industry is that the only way the city management will recommend this to you, and of course you'll have the final say regardless, would be if they show a public benefit, meaning you put up one digital, you take down five others. You know, there, it has to be some quid pro quo. Uh, the advantage to the digital is the fact that you can tailor that. So for example, if you're Hardy's Biscuits, on the way in in the morning, you can say, stop by and get hot coffee and biscuits. And at noon, you can stop by and say, get our new, you know, 18 ounce, uh, you know, 4,000 calorie hamburger. And at night, stop by and get our chicken. That, that benefit is a financial benefit to them. Mm -hmm. So don't be surprised if we do move in this direction, if you're comfortable with this and it gets adopted, that shortly we will be visited by the billboard industry again. We're not opposed to billboard signs being digital. We have the same concern about foot candles and luminosity. But our thought is there has to be a public benefit. By you take down these, we will give you these. This is another little thought maybe apropos of nothing uh, our new message boards for ITS system just curious you know, on the luminosity on on those things I know it's for a That's public a benefit mm -hmm. but but you know what's what are they doing and what what sort of controls do they have for adjustment yeah we can check good question um, as far as the 50 percent is everyone comfortable with that and then the change in the whole time and we'll bring back more information about the luminosity Okay, explain the 50% one more time. Um, so right now, the standalone pole sign is allowed 30%. Your development entrance shopping center sign is allowed 50%. So just as we're bringing the height more equitable, we were proposing bringing the percentage allowed for the electronic message board more equitable. 
give you an example. Let's say Olive Garden can have a 150 square foot sign. 50 square feet of that 150 could be an electronic message center at 30%. It's a more business friendly formula in that it basically says instead of a sign this big, you can have it this big. It does add to more light out on the roadway. I mean, I don't think it's a big deal. When, when ECU a couple of years ago first put up a big electronic sign, that's all you heard on the radio. Uh, the complaints about how bright it was, and they finally, you know, toned it down. <coughs> so, correction on my math. So, 150 square foot Olive Garden could have 45 square feet of an electronic message board sign. Is that right? So, under the 50 percent, they could go to 75. So, is that an acceptable increase to 50 percent? I don't think that's going to change what they put up because you're limited to 20 feet. Well, you're not going to go 20 feet out. In the example that Abigail has, I mean, it is, I believe they went with the full 50%. Which one? On the mall sign. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, that's, that's not 50. That's looking sign because you're low to the ground. Now, the part here that changes is the red part. Is that what you're saying? Correct, mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Thank you. You know, I, you know, I, I would yeah. certainly be opposed to a 30-foot in the air sign would allow 50 percent of it but uh, maybe it's not so bad a little lower so what percent is that 30. that i believe is 50. yeah yes. or close oh, to it so. yeah and, and i can tell you this from experience the multi-tenant shopping centers have had a difficult time getting all their tenants adequate space under the new regulation that we had so this would help give them more square footage to allow ample or, or what I would call adequate signage for their tenants out on the road. You're not, you're not increasing the square footage, no. only the square footage of it that can be used for electronic. Correct. Right. Oh, and we oh, just oh, oh, changed, oh, oh. Yeah. remember we just changed, we had the 80 foot rule before, oh. 30 feet on the top, 10, 10, 10, 10. So it was max of 80. We have so now changed that. that. So if you look at the stay the same and give them more square footage for their sign. <coughs> well, this it would be their option if they want to to put fit up to fifty percent. So the reason I'm saying that is, for example, if you have six tenants and based on an average shopping center, by the time you get the design work done, each tenant has a panel of about twelve inches. Well, on twelve inches, you can't really <laughs> you can't really do anything. But one of the things, and, and you know the industry better than any of the rest of us, but you know, one of the things that we find is that uh, if you're going to regulate signage and you're going to encourage the aesthetic side, there comes a point where you ask, what is the value of having any sign out there other than the name of the center? Because you know, when, you have a, when you have a sign that's pick a number four feet wide and two feet high and has your name on it, and it's in a menu board, you're not going to see that at especially at miles an hour. hour. I so mean, I would barely see it standing still. You yeah. know, but, uh, so you either you either have to have a whole lot of signage, or you have to encourage people to use their signage in one way to call it, you know, the Lazara Center, yeah. and that way you know that the new Lazara's Pizza, which by the way is extremely tasty and is <laughs> on uh, on stone baked ovens. Isn't that what you call them? Stone baked ovens. You know, go to the Lazaro Center. <laughs> I mean, he's trying to help you out. <laughs> we will do more research. I think the important thing is you all are giving us a comfort that you would like to see us try to move in this direction. Okay, that sounds that good. Sounds, yeah. The next is sort of, so right now we have kind of a messy and you'll see in your handout um, the existing ordinance we have as far as temporary and feather flags and sort of a proposed reorganizing simplification we have a lot of um, regulations for signs such as like grand openings things like that that don't require permits and are kind of 
confusing and not really um, um, not really clear. So there's depending on what type of sign you are, you could have it for three days, you could have two per lot, you could have one per lot, you could have it for ten days, you can have five. So as far as temporary signage, it's kind of all over the board. I mean, they're all supposed to draw attention for some sort of temporary event, but we have, based on whether it's a banner or a flag, different regulations, which is kind of confusing and difficult to enforce. We also have an exemption for flags, and this was sort of written with the intention of like flying the American flag or the state flag. Since it was written, feather flags were invented, and they have been interpreted as flags, which then allow the, the flag to stay up there for an indefinite period of time, but your grand opening banner only for 10 days, 15 days, depending on what temporary sign category it falls in. So here's just some examples of the American flag banners. We'll go back Ooh. one second. You know, to make the point, the American flags that are there can fly every day, all day long, 365 days a year. The one that says Superstore, how long can it be there? Um, that, I believe, is associated with the opening of like 15 days, I think. Um, and it can only have two per lot based on it being a banner. Um, these feather flags have fallen under the interpretation of also flags, so they, same thing, indefinite period of time as long as they're not torn, weathered, tattered, just as the American flag in the previous picture. Some more examples of the feather flags that are out there. A couple more examples, some temporary signs there. Um, and as you'll see the, on the handout, I kind of propose basically doing two categories. So rather than have temporary signs, whether you're a banner, where you're a corrugated sign, whether you're a feather flag, basically you have <coughs> temporary signage, whether it's inflatable, whether it's a feather flag, just any kind of temporary sign that's going to be up there. And what I would like to discuss is setting a number, a duration, and whether those re require a permit. I think for simplification and just to make it easier for everyone, rather than treat a feather flag and a banner differently, we call them all temporary signs, give them the same duration, um, number, and either a permit or not a permit, based on what your opinion is and which direction you'd like us to take those. So really you're looking at the last page of the handout Correct. D? Yeah. So um, if you'll look at... The first page, existing ordinance, you'll see we have signs excluded from regu regulations and certain temporary signs. They're kind of in two different categories, and you don't know if you're looking like G is banner signs, J is temporary signs, so it's kind of confusing both as to enforce and as an applicant knowing which category you fall in. The proposed simplification C basically takes all of the exemptions for Christmas lights, for campaign signs, puts them all in one category, doesn't change the language, just basically reorganizes them so that what is working now stays working and then creates a new category for temporary, and we'll talk about window signs in a second, so don't get distracted by that yet, but creates a new category for temporary signs that says, regardless of inflatable banner, flyer, flag sign, whatever, you're a temporary sign, and then whichever we decide here as far as days, number, duration, zoning permit, we can treat them all the same. Okay, so let me ask one more time. The, we understand that uh, the first several pages show how confusing it is because some signs get to stay up there three days, some two days, some 15 days. But uh, tell us again on paragraph C, the third page, it says proposed simplification yes. C, signs excluded from permit. So this is just sort of a reorganization of what you see in the first one. Um, like the sign, face replacement is there, signs of non-commercial, that is the exact same language that you'll see in the first one. It takes um, letters F, J, I, and J, which are sort of the temporary, the signs are um, erected in connection of festivals, banner signs for av advertising including inflatables, Flags um, is in there for the differentiation between feather flags and the American flag, and then certain temporary signs <coughs> not fall into the other categories. So it basically takes those items, condenses them all into, on the last page, D1. 
and the 15 days and four times a year, that's just sort of basically the most lenient of what we allow now. That is sort of a starting discussion point, not necessarily the correct numbers. Okay, let's, if you don't mind, let's focus on paragraph D, the temporary signs, forget wins at the moment. And so what you're suggesting is that on temporary signs, that whether it's a banner, an advertising inflatable, such as balloons, feather flags, or something similar, they shall not be erected for more than 15 days at a time and no more than four times a year. No more than five such signs may be displayed per lot at any given time. That's mm, what the... Correct. And one other change with this new D category, we would require a permit while some of the temporary signs do not require a permit and some do currently. So we would follow with the UDO, we have a zoning permit. Um, so that so it enables us to enforce and make sure that, you know, they're only out there for 15 days, it's only five per lot or whatever direction we go. So it would give us a tracking mechanism whether or not we charge a fee for it or how we do that is um, open for discussion, but it would at least allow us to make sure that we are enforcing and enforcing equitably. Is there any kind of regulation as far as it being on the lot? the premises where they're um, advertising? Yeah, there's a um, basically a restriction for all signage that it has to be out of the right of way, so it would have to be on their property. Let me go back and ask a, a more basic question. You know, these are the feather yeah, flags yeah, that we property, that we see up. And I think the question is, you know, do you think that they should be regulated? Do you think you know, forget a minute whether you have to get a permit, forget a minute whether they can stay up there, you know, year round or only 15 days. I think the basic question is, here is a car lot. You pass it on a regular basis out here on 17. You can count one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. I believe there are eight mm -hmm. that are there. And the question is, is that something we currently really are not regulating? Is that something that you think we should regulate at least as far as the number of signs that people have out there? Well, anybody? I mean, what you're saying here is that just for your example, you gave us five times 15, or was it four times 15? So you're talking about 60 days a year, where now it's 365. Right? Correct. With the okay. flags, not so. with the, it goes to the, like the banner signs in the first example, that has a limited duration. The feather flags, because they're interpreted right. it the same as the right. um, American flag, yes, it's so all of the so five days. But, but on your limited duration, there is a limited duration, but then you can put up another banner. And Correct. you can put up another banner. So you can have a banner there 365 days a year. Mm -hmm. Under your proposal here, feather flags and banners can now could only be displayed 15 days at a time, no more than four times. That would be a dramatic change as far as the uh, banners. Uh, the feather flags are another discussion, but that would be a dramatic change for the business community as well as some other folks with banners. What are we gaining by regulating them? I think that, personally, I think you're gaining three things. Number one is aesthetic control. Number two, quality of what is up there and how long it can be there. And then the third thing, I think you're gaining a degree of safety. Do you actually need, in this case, and everybody has an opinion, the person who runs the car lot obviously believes he needs eight signs. Uh, on the other hand, does he actually need eight signs? I would say to you, I'm not in favor of prohibiting them. I think that they're, that these, personally, I prefer these much more than I like the basic little uh, styrofoam signs that you see most campaign, uh, you know, most of the campaign style signs. On the other side, if they are not properly maintained, and we do have many in the city that have been up there so long that they are sun dried, they are now torn, it does not give the appearance of a quality community. One of the advantages of requiring them to come down at a period of time is most people would then at least be looking at their signs and hopefully putting back up quality signs. 
I think from you know one of the things I've learned over the years is silence uh, gives you just as much information as uh, as uh, pardon the expression speech. It appears that your silence is you're very hesitant to do this, and the last thing we would do is push you. What I'd ask you to do on these again is over the next several days go out and look again. I don't believe that we want to totally prohibit them. I don't know how much bureaucracy we want to put into regulating whether you keep them five days, ten days, twenty days. Administrative headache. Yeah. Oh, yes. You know, but yeah. My my concern is one. I I don't like them aesthetically. On the other hand, the amount of effort that I think it would take to enforce would be out of proportion to to the problems that they potentially cause from the aesthetics. I mean, they're not very expensive. I mean, you get one for about 55 or $60, I think, the whole set. So when you somebody said around 300 bucks. No, a flag. I'm talking about these flag things. I mean, they're, and the, and the one thing about the lot that bothers, seems, I don't know if you say unfair or what, but maybe I've got a big lot, yeah, you know. and maybe you've got a little small lot, and you get five, I get five. And that was, Shucks. Yeah. You know, that's you could, you yeah, could we do could also do a number based well, on lot size. Yeah. Or yeah. Like that. I mean, I understand I, that, but I'm like Richard. I'm, like the silence. <laughs> you know, I, I, I would be very it. concerned to how much, how much time and effort it would take for for code enforcement to try <laughs> to keep up with with these. When, when I think we have bigger problems for nuisance and and, and issues that are that are causing actually negative impacts to their neighbors or or to the community more so than this than these signs. So, well, how about if we agree this? Y'all look at them and think from the standpoint of do you want to at least regulate how many you can have based upon street frontage? Because already you have proportionality on your sign ordinance because, you know, if I've got a 50-foot lot and you've got a 200-foot lot, you automatically get more. So I, I, you know, one of my big concerns, we have a lot of car dealers, you know, and, and this is kind of something that they historically do is they celebrate their sales of automobiles you know i really uh, I, I mean I, I don't think i'm speaking for everybody but i probably am but i'm a little hesitant about pushing that envelope over there you know and uh making their business a little tougher you know what i mean uh i do have concerns about allowing these flags to come in states of disrepair and not being changed out you know you know as far as the status is concerned there needs to be something there for us to be able to fall back on in the event that we have to take some type of enforcement action or administrative action to get the property owner to change the flags out that are flopping in you know flopping in strings and all that kind of stuff mm -hmm. uh, but you know you know that's something we probably need to look at is is how many signs on the lot uh, I don't think you can segregate different businesses. I don't think we would want to get into that. But, you know, as far as proportionality and lot size, that may be something we want to look at, like you said. Well, we'll do more research. I'll go and look also, and we'll see if we can come up with uh, something that improves the community without being overly burdensome from a regulatory standpoint. Does that sound like a fair direction? Sounds like a wonderful yeah. direction. Okay. Now, we saved the best for last, and boy, this is, uh, there is no question that, uh, that this is probably the hardest nut to crack. I'll give you uh, a, a true example, uh, and my wife is probably going to kill me. I hope she's not watching right now, but about a month ago, you know, it was 9.15 at night, and uh, Gwen turns to me and she said, um, I want some chocolate. Well, you married men know exactly what that just said. Okay, 9.15, I'm in my truck. I go up to the local 7-Eleven, Handy Mart, whatever. And what am I there for? To buy gas. Mm, no, I'm there to buy chocolate. As I pulled into the filling station that we use all the time, probably the first time ever, it was dark. Because most of the time when I'm filling up for gas, it's daytime. What I saw, I'm going to ask each of you to do the same thing. I'm going to go ask you to look at these filling stations at night. Most of them are open until 12 or 1 o'clock in the morning. Many of them are open later than that. And we know from crime statistics that robberies occur 
you know, it's, it's something that occurs many times at night. When I pulled in and, you know, we got all the glass and everything there, I could not see inside the store at all. Why? Because everything was plastered with Cokes, three for five dollars, whatever, whatever, whatever. I guess it wouldn't have been so bad if at least one of the banners had said candy bars or chocolate, three for five dollars or something. But it brought home to me the fact that it is a safety issue. I'm certainly not suggesting that we should get to the point of making everybody take down every sign. You all saw uh, a lot of signage when you were on your tour. Mm -hmm. But I do think we have to look at the safety element because when a police officer pulls up there and is checking that store at night, they need to be able to look in to a reasonable degree and be safe. A citizen walking into that store needs to be able to know what's going on to a reasonable degree. And that doesn't mean total visibility. But with that, Abigail, let's talk again about signs. Yep. Um, our current uh, regulations are 75% coverage temporarily. Most cases, as you saw, they're not temporary, they're permanent decals. When we adopted the UDO, we also adopted that street level windows must be visible from three to eight feet, which conflicts with the sign coverage because it's obviously not going to be completely visible if you have a sign there. So here's, if you remember, some of the signs that we've gone through. Um, you'll see this last one here was just tinting as opposed to signage, but it still blocked the view. See, there's kind of the filling station example. Um, this one's would be within our regulations less than 75 percent pretty open. A lot of comparable communities have less than 30 percent, some as low as 10. It's kind of, we're definitely on the high end with our 75 percent. So what we're looking at here is basically reducing that total percentage um, and then using the premise of the door completely open. So changing instead of all windows have to be open from three to eight feet, it would just be the door. And as we discussed with the temporary signs, a lot of these signs just kind of pop up. There's no permit, there's no tracking measure. So it would be another question that we would ask you is, do you want to do the zoning permit route for this to see, to make sure that there's only the 50% coverage with them and make sure that the door remains open. Yeah, and so what we're, you know, what you all said to us when we had the tour was that you really don't want to get into telling a person that they can't have anything on their windows. On the other hand, maybe a reasonable compromise is to say the door itself has to be clear where you can see in it from a safety standpoint. And in that three to eight foot area, fine, if you want to put your store hours in there that say open, you know, 7 a.m. to 7 p.m., or if you want to put, push the word for, uh, you know, certain basketball fans push versus pull, you know, that's okay. But as far as plastering the door where you can't see in from a safety standpoint, you know, that's, that's our suggestion. We would prefer a much wider openness, but I think a reasonable compromise from a safety standpoint might be to say, look, your door has to be clear where we can see in it. And again, here's what I'd like for you to do. Not make a decision tonight. I'd like for you to go out at night and look at some of these places and you come back, you know, at the next workshop or whenever we bring this up again and say, I didn't see what you saw or yes, I did see. And by the way, just for the record, yes, I did get her chocolate with almonds. <laughs> yeah. Is that a fair request of you? Yes. Yeah. And I, and I personally don't, I don't have a problem with the door uh, requirement. I mean, I, I, I think that's a fairly reasonable request. Uh, I don't, you know, with the door, I don't think that's unreasonable. Y'all look in and give us further direction. Anything else on signs? Um, nope, I think that was... We're going to talk about signs. signs. Yeah. yeah. Um, One thing, uh, in, in the interest of time, I think what we will we'll also do, let's move real quickly to the second topic, and that is just simply, a, and then we'll adjourn so you can take a break before the meeting. 
camera plan and upcoming amendments. And we're not asking you to do anything tonight. We're just updating you on what we're doing. Please. Um, over the past six months, several rezonings have come. And if you remember, some of them were in compliance with the camera land use, some were not. So I believe it's seven was the total count. But uh, this is one where it is low density residential. And the suggestion was to change it to neighborhood commercial. So we would go ahead and bring that forward. Yeah, hang on one second. Also remember, when we adopted the CAMA master plan, instead of bringing amendments every month, what we said is we would bring them back twice a year. So the staff is getting ready in December or January to bring them to you, and all we're doing tonight is refreshing your memory on those that are going to be brought to you. So you've actually acted on all of these. Um, this one was high density residential, and the suggestion was to change it to mixed use with the rezoning. And that's where? This is Western, Western. Western Branch. Yep. Um, this one was medium density residential, and the suggestion was to change it to mixed use. It's on Drummer Kellum. There's the auto lot in this one right here. This one was just a couple months ago, right across the street. Um, it is low density residential, the yellow on the left there of Bayshore, and then the other side is public institutional with the rezoning. We would change those all to public institutional. Um, this was the rezoning on Ward Street. They're currently high density residential. We would change that to mixed use. And then the last one, um, this is a split one with um, mixed use and <coughs> conservation. And we have sort of the whole uh, waterfront being conservation. So when we're looking at this amendment, we'd also look at, we don't have a category currently in our CAMA, but other communities use the urban waterfront category. And a lot of times when you have the boardwalk and that kind of nice walkable riverfront, it's the urban waterfront CAMA uh, designation. That's not a category that exists in our CAMA currently. So we, I've been doing some research along with some of the other uh, planners here to bring forward a urban waterfront category to use in areas like this and along the um, waterfront on the other side of the bridges. And the advantage to that is it gives you breaks on setback requirements for uh, based upon camera regulations. If you do not have the urban waterfront designation, you have to set much further back. By putting this in your, uh, in your land use plan, it allows you to go much closer to the waterfront. Yes. Those will go through the planning advisory board and yes. then to the council? Yeah. So none of these, these are all related to rezonings, as Dr. Woodruff said in the beginning. So it's not anything new. The new thing will be the urban waterfront category. If we add that in. That concludes those items for the workshop, Mayor. Thank you all for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you, Abigail. Thank you Ryan. Thank you, Ashley. All right, so uh, we're going to go ahead and uh, entertain a motion to adjourn the workshop. Second. All in favor? Aye. Right.